Okay, let's get into the other systems. And here we're kind of mixing some different systems up. I'm going to start with the vaginal microbiota, and I have the curiosity um, symbol on these uh, because this is more um, conceptual than the things I wanted to get into, and it doesn't, it's not really an infectious disease, but it's an important microbiology thing. So, as you know, the vaginal microbiota are kind of driven by um, what is provided from the mucosal lining. Um, so what is secreted, like the various sugars and the various antimicrobial um, proteins that are released, um, end up selecting for certain bacteria, typically lactobacillus. And the lactobacillus will typically drive down the pH even further, um, and that protects the vagina from a lot of um, potential pathogens that would colonize. Um, and what people end up getting is a diverse community of different lactobacillus um, species and within the different species, multiple strains. And that changes, um, that community changes regularly over the course of a menstrual cycle in a way that is partially driven by what is provided from the host or um, the, the mucosa. And these are just showing different, um, how different, um, these are all proteins, how the different protein um, abundance goes up and down. And this partially drives um, the community. Now this is from an article where four healthy women um, were sampled and their uh, microbiota was exhaustively um, examined. This is a weird thing to look at, so let me walk you through it. What they're showing is over a number of weeks, so 13, almost four, uh, or wait, I can't even see, 15 weeks, um, Every few days, a sample was taken, and um, the researchers figured out which bacteria were present um, in the vaginal microbiota. They standardized this, or they they um, label menstrual periods with these red dots. So what is this weird stuff? Well, what they do is they find sort of the, the relative numbers of all the different bacteria. So at any given time point, like if we look this over here on the far left, at any given time point, they just see how much of each different species is there. And they um, normalize it to add up to 100%. And so they give each different species its own color and they stack them in a recognizable way. So one species is this red one and they always put it on the bottom. And then they add um, this green one above it and they add all of them up to get to 100. So in this, in this woman, her, um, her microbiota had something like one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven different bacteria that would appear over something like uh, four menstrual cycles. In this woman, um, it's different because that's, that one species dominated her whole community at all but one point. And that change that happened what do doesn't seem to have been driven by um, the menstrual cycle at all. Another woman had a very diverse, um, what we'd call a very diverse community the whole time, where you could count a higher number of uh, different bacterial species, and they each have more of an even amount. They're each present in roughly the same amount. And so that's another measure of diversity. Um, because here in this time point, for example, there might be uh, four different uh, bacteria, but one of them dominates. And in this community, that domination doesn't really exist in the same way. Um, and in this woman's community, you can kind of maybe see um, an effect of the menstrual cycle, and maybe not. And in this woman's community, nothing exactly repeatable happens as a um, result of the menstrual cycle, except that whatever this dominant bacterium is, to some extent, it goes down in abundance during each menstrual um, event. And at the very end, it is completely replaced 
by some other. So, okay, so I just walked through these four different graphs, and the whole point here is showing that there are very different ways a healthy microbiota can look. And we don't know, um, we, we don't know what, if any, um, health-related impacts these differences have. These people were all um, healthy. They had no detectable um, illnesses. And so if we start from this, we can move on to thinking about um, bacterial vaginosis, which is one of the most um, common microbial um, diseases. And bacterial vaginosis is a state of dysbiosis. Um, and what that means is the community uh, structure is disrupted. So the normal groups of lactobacillus would be changed significantly. And most of the time, this has no associated symptoms, but sometimes um, it's associated with a distinctive fishy odor and um, discharge and maybe itching. So minor, but um, distracting and annoying. The, the reason this is taken seriously um, beyond an annoyance is that it, it, it is a state of dysbiosis. It means that the microbial community is not performing a function it's supposed to perform. Um, and that function that it's lost is protection against um, infections. And so during an episode of bacterial vaginosis, um, the vaginal microbiota can be invaded by pathogens more easily than it can um, at any other time. Additionally, um, this can lead to um, various complications um, like disrupted pregnancies. Uh, and so th these things have been well described, and the prevalence of it is pretty well known, um, but the cause of it is not known. So what are the risk factors? Because that's a question we can ask. We have a lot of data, and so um, researchers have been able to identify risk factors, but not um, a causative relationship between any one thing and uh, the condition. And so risk factors are typically lifestyle things like um, sexual activity. Any kind of sexual activity increases the risk. Uh, douching increases the risk. Those are the only major risk factors um, that have been identified. So this is kind of a mysterious and poorly understood thing. But some other things we know is that the fishy odor, which is the best known characteristic, um, there are a lot of different bacteria that can do the met metabolic um, reactions that make that odor. We know that this doesn't cause inflammation, so the body doesn't recognize this as an, any kind of um, threat. And uh, we know that one common thing that is seen during episodes of this is a decrease in the abundance of lactobacillus. When we think about treatments, it's a tricky thing because we are trying to make a bacterial community behave itself and we don't know what disrupted it in the first place. Um, so one thing that we can do is use antibiotics that will um, cause a very random and drastic um, change in the microbial community by killing off certain species and not others. Um, and that can give uh, the, the body um, a chance to control the microbiota again. So that's how an antibiotic might work. Because we don't, we don't associate this condition with any one bacterium. It's not like an infectious disease caused by a particular pathogen, to our knowledge. Um, so that is bacterial vaginosis. So that... Um, so now we shift gears and go into um, sexually transmitted diseases and infections. I like to use the term sexually transmitted infection or STI uh, because so many of these are largely asymptomatic. Um, but it's, there are 
all of these terms are terms that you need to know. Venereal disease, VD, sexually transmitted disease, STD, STI. Um, again, I will use STI most of the time. So um, these are prevalence numbers, and I'm sorry they're kind of small, but this is the most up-to-date um, information I could get. Um, these numbers are not to scale with each other. But in all cases, this is kind of interesting. They have a dark green bar for prevalence of the disease, of the pathogen, and then a light green bar for incidence. So, for example, with HPV, you tell me what that stands for. With HPV, um, prevalence is much greater than incidence. And that's because there are latent, long-term HPV infections. A person can have a very long or lifelong HPV infection. Um, and so something like, in the U.S., something like 40 million people have um, HPV infections. This 13 million is how many cases, new cases, happen each year. So there are roughly one-third as many new cases as there are um, old cases. We see a similar thing with herpes simplex 2, um, which causes, well, this is the, the main strain that causes genital herpes. And in this one, the um, lifelong, um, many cases, asymptomatic infections vastly outnumber new cases. The situation is reversed um, for trichomonas, trichomoniasis. This is a, um, this is a protist and typically it doesn't last very long, um, so new cases greatly outnumber old cases. And we see the same pattern for chlamydia and gonorrhea. Um, so that's the kind of thing you see reflected in data like this. And again, these are not to scale because there's no scale you could use um, that would allow you to see any detail both from HPV and from any of the bacterial causes. So if you want to see how HPV goes up and down from year to year, you have to be able to see the difference between 40 million and 45 million and 50 million compared to 2 million to 3 million for something like chlamydia. Okay, so overall you can come back to this to get a sense of how common these things are. That brings us to the two major bacterial sexually transmitted infections, or the two most common, which are going to be the, the um, infections caused by chlamydia trachomatis and Neisseria gonorrhea. These have a lot of similarities, um, kind of a surprising number for bacteria that are not that common, not that similar to each other. Um, and I'll, I'll cover them separately, but you will see the similarities. Uh, chlamydia, bacteria from this genus, are obligate intracellular pathogens. They cannot, um, they can't make their own ATP, it turns out. They have to steal it from a host cell. And so their lifestyle is a little bit like a virus's lifestyle, except that uh, they are not assembled by the host cell. And they have their own ribosomes and all that kind of stuff. Um, Still, it's a weird lifestyle they they live, and we don't even really know whether they have peptidoglycan or not. They are mysterious, partly because we can't grow them on agar. They can't grow unless we have a system for converting their used ADP into new ATP, like a host cell does. Like these cells, these chlamydial cells will kind of pretend to be mitochondria inside our cells. Um, but they do everything a little bit backwards. They take the ATP and turn it into ADP. So in a lot of cases, uh, there are no symptoms. But um, there can be there can be symptoms and there can be um, serious complications for both of these diseases. Um, so the symptoms females and males will get um, both have to do with inflammation of both the urethra and the reproductive tract. Um, and the complications involve uh, bacteria damaging the epithelia and causing inflammation. 
and in some cases they're able to move beyond that. So the complications we see involve the bacteria moving away from the epithelial layer um, either up the female reproductive tract towards the ovaries or um, into the tissues. A similar sort of thing happens in males with a similar idea to, of the, the complications um, in moving up um, the reproductive tract towards the testes. Um, and so as this bacterium grows within the cells, we have a sort of limited um, opportunities for our immune system to fight against them, right? If you think about what we can do to, um, to invaders that don't travel around in our blood, well, our antibodies are useless. Um, so we have to rely on other things. And part of that leads to an anti-parasitic um, inflammation that really does cause damage to the body. So these bacteria do other things beyond the sexually transmitted uh, diseases. So certainly um, they're able to cause other sexually transmitted diseases. So um, oral and um, like oral and anal sex can lead to um, infections of the pharynx, infections of the rectum. In, in all those cases, they just specialize in attacking the mucosal um, epithelium. Also, uh, these, these bacteria are a common cause of um, serious conjunctivitis, especially in newborns and other children. And um, this is the world's leading cause of preventable blindness. So, when a, a baby is born in the U.S., uh, they're given eye drops. Um, as far as I know, they contain erythromycin, and that works against both uh, chlamydia and Neisseria, both of which cause sexually transmitted diseases and both of which can cause blindness as well, although in different ways. Um, so we can treat chlamydial infections. Um, we don't have sophisticated uh, prevention for them. Okay, so I've been talking about um, Neisseria gonorrhea, and this is from a different genus. It behaves in different ways, um, but ultimately it causes a similar disease. Um, so in females, they'll have um, inflammation and disruption um, of the reproductive tract, and potentially complications that involve um, bacteria and inflammation moving up towards the ovaries, leading to things like sterility and, and worse. In males, again, it's a similar idea. So there are other diseases associated with this bacteria. Again, with uh, neonates, um, an eye infection is possible, and Neisseria gonorrhea doesn't cause the conjunctivitis that chlamydia causes. It causes a corneal infection. Um, that can lead to blindness. Either way, both both diseases, both pathogens um, can be um, stopped or killed with um, the same antibiotics in some cases. So the most common serious complication of both of these pathogens is pelvic inflammatory disease. And this is where um, this is where the bacteria are moving up uh, from the vagina. Um, into the, the, the uterus and fallopian tubes and potentially ovary. And this is invasive, and so this can lead to um, fever and other symptoms of an immune response and also dysregulation of the menstrual cycle. Um, and so the, the complications of this range from everything from um, sterility that we could predict from scarring of reproductive organs to... Um, abscesses and peritonitis. Those are both situations where bacteria are escaping from uh, the reproductive system into uh, the peritoneum. And they're either escaping away from the reproductive organs into the peritoneum or being trapped in abscesses. Um, so in both of those cases, this is the primary group of complications that occur in females. Um, and these are typically the what we're trying to prevent by by treating these diseases. 
Okay, so that's enough of these two. In the next video, we will look at syphilis.